word defiance is defined in Webster's Dictionary as a deliberate disregard or disobedience toward authority. A second definition by Webster's Dictionary is defiance is an attitude or action that is designed to provoke hostility. Defiance is when someone in authority over us commands us to do something and we look them straight in the eye and we say, I'm not going to do it. That is defiance. How many times in this life are we like the little boy whose mom told him to sit in the corner because, or in, the, in time out because he was disobeying her and he responded to her by saying, I may be sitting down on the outside, but on the inside I'm still standing up. And how many times are we like in a car and we're already late, we're doing our best to stay inside the speed limit. But we mutter to ourselves, I may be doing 65 on the outside, but inside I'm doing 80. I'd like to be able to say that it is only unbelievers that struggle with defiance. But at times, genuine followers of Christ can be every bit as defiant toward God and toward other authorities as what unbelievers are. To those believers who struggle with being defiant of God and toward others, I encourage you this morning, we are going to be looking at some lesson from another person in the Bible that was a defiant believer. From the life of Jonah, we learn four major lessons about defiance. Yes, Jonah was a follower of God. He was even a prophet of God. But he was a defiant prophet of God. I want to spend the next five weeks looking at the book of Jonah. This morning I want to set the historical setting behind the book. And then the next four weeks we're going to look at four different observations about defiance that we can learn from the life of Jonah so that we don't repeat his mistakes. Starting next week we'll be looking at the first of these hard-earned lessons from the life of defiant Jonah from Jonah chapter 1. And if you're following along inside your, uh, you do have a, a paper that gives the historical background behind the book of Jonah. Most scholars believe that this book was written by Jonah, but what do we know about Jonah? Well, we know that Jonah, the name Jonah means dove. I've had several people ask me, they say, why do you name your dog Lucy? Because I like what it means. I actually looked up what names meant. And the name Lucy means light. Well, the name Jonah means dove. His father's name was Amittai, according to Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. He was from a place called Gath Hepher, which is mentioned in Joshua 19, verse 13, which was located three miles northeast of Nazareth, which is where Jesus was, was raised. Jonah served as a prophet, according to 2 Kings 14, 25, in the northern kingdom of Israel in the days of Jeroboam II, who was one of the kings of Israel that reigned from 793 to 753 B.C. Amos and Hosea, Hosea also prophesied during the reign of Jeroboam II, though we don't know if they knew each other or not. They probably did. But Jonah's the only prophet that Jesus himself directly likened himself. Jesus likened Jonah's experience in the belly of the great fish with his own death, burial, and resurrection. In Matthew 12, verse 40, Jesus said, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now as most of us know, Jonah was commissioned by God to preach God's message to the people of Nineveh, which was a, one of the most important and yet wicked cities of all of the Assyrian Empire. It was the capital of Assyria. Jonah's responsibility was to warn the people of Nineveh that God and it was about to judge their sins. But what all we know about the city of Nineveh? Well, every now and then we will have a missionary come in to speak to our, to our church and they'll share what their country or the city that they're going to be going to was like. Well, I want to do that with the book of Jonah. The city of Nineveh was about 500 miles northeast of Israel. It had been named after its founder, Nimrod, and thus it's called the city of Nineveh. The name Nimrod means fish. One of the sad features of the people of Nineveh is they actually worshipped fish god. Can you believe it? They worshipped two idols that were both in the shape of a fish. The Ninevites worshipped Nancy, 
which was a goddess of fresh water and a fish god named Dagon. And Dagon was nothing more than a statue of a man with a fish's head. Did you believe people actually did that? They actually worshipped these kind of statues. Nineveh was a very large city at that point. In the days of Nineveh, it was believed that they had somewhere between 600,000 and a million people inside the city of Nineveh. According to historians, the walls of the city stretched out almost eight miles in circumference. The surrounding district of Nineveh was over 60 miles in circumference. It was located on the banks of the Tigris River, but have archaeologists actually confirmed that there is there was such a place as Nineveh. As most of you might know, I, I thoroughly enjoy archaeology. I am very intrigued by the archaeological discoveries that have made, been made by man over the years that back up God's book, the Bible. When the city of Nineveh was excavated by archaeologists, thousands of clay tablets were discovered which made, which made up the library of King Asher Panobal of Assyria who reigned in 650 BC. In 1872, these tablets were deciphered by a man named George Smith of the British Museum. He found a set sets of seven tablets which told the story of creation called the Creation Epic. On these seven tablets, he, made, he uh, the it backed up the biblical account of seven days of creation, six days when God created, and one where God rested. Also found in excavations at Nineveh was a little seal that had, that's now in a British museum that showed a tree in the center, a man on one side, a woman on the other side, and an erect serpent standing behind the woman. Also found at the city of, of Nineveh's excavations were clay tablets which described the Babylonian account of Noah's flood. But what actually happened to the city of Nineveh? Well, the prophets of Nahum and Zephaniah in the Bible predicted that the city of, of Nineveh would be totally destroyed. If God says something's going to be destroyed, guess what's going to happen to it? It's going to be destroyed. According to ancient history, the Medo-Persian forces came against Assyria and destroyed it in, in 612 B.C. under the leadership of Xerxes and Nabopolassar. Nineveh's destruction was predicted long, way, way before it ever happened. Listen to two references from the book of Nahum and Zephaniah that predicted that this city was going to be destroyed. Nahum 2, verse 13 reads, I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will burn up your chariots in smoke, and the sword will devour your young lions. I will leave you no prey on the earth. The voices of your messengers will no longer be heard. Nahum's prophecy was made in 663 B.C., a long time before the city of Nineveh was destroyed, along with the rest of the Assyrian Empire. Nahum 2, verse 13, alludes to young lions being devoured. The emblem that represented Assyria was a lion, which was known for its majesty and power. It was also an emblem of violence and bloodshed, and the carrying off of its prey on the part of the Assyrian soldiers. These young lions, were, which described Assyria, there, there are monuments that they've discovered in archaeology of these, of these uh, statues of lions that, that were representative of Assyria. Nahum predicted those young lions, Assyria and Nineveh, are going to be destroyed. But not only did Nahum predict the destruction of Nineveh, but so did the prophet Zephaniah, also found in the Bible. Zephaniah 2, verses 13 to 15 reads, He will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria, leaving Nineveh utterly de desolate and dry as a desert. Flocks and herds will lie down there, creatures of every kind. The desert owl and the screech owl will roost on her columns. Their calls will echo through the windows. Rubble will be in the doorways. The beams of cedar will be exposed. This is the carefree living city that lived in safety. She said to herself, I am, and there is none beside me. What a ruin she has become, a lair for, large, for wild beasts. All who pass by her scoff and shake their fists. 
Zephaniah prophecy was made in 623 B.C. 12 years, 13 years before Assyria and Nineveh was destroyed. Assyria was destroyed in 612 B.C. Archaeology discoveries on the ruins of Sennacherib, which was one of their king's palace in Nineveh, was done by Sir Henry Layer in 1850. The archaeologists discovered, all their discoveries confirmed that everything that God said would happen in Nineveh, happened in Nineveh. Sir Henry Layer found that the city of Nineveh was totally destroyed, except for some jackals and gazelles and hyenas who made their dens in the mounds of this city. Even today, archaeology continues to verify the Bible. The historical destruction of Nineveh's destruction was also written in the Babylonian Chronicles, which tells of a Babylonian king named Nebuchadnezzar, who told it of forming a coalition made up of the Babylonians, the Medes, and the Scythians, who brought down the city of Nineveh after a short siege of only three months. Through archaeology, we know the exact location of where this book was written, the city of Nineveh. But well, what was the city of Nineveh like morally in the days of Jonah? Well, Jonah doesn't describe how wicked they were, but Nahum does. The book of Nahum, also in the Old Testament, tells us that, that the people of Nineveh exploited the helpless. Nahum 2, verse 12. She devised evil plots against God, Nahum 1, verse 9. She was extremely cruel in war, according to Numbers, Nahum chapter 2, verses 13, 12 and 13. And she was known for her idolatry, prostitution, and her witchcraft, according to Nahum chapter 3, verse 4. But why did Jonah hate the people of Nineveh so bad? Most missionaries, when they go to a country to present people with God's word, they love the country that they're going into. Well, not Nineveh, and not Jonah. Jonah didn't want to see God save the people of Nineveh. He wanted God to destroy the people of Nineveh. Why? Well, this is conjecture, but in addition to the Syrians being extremely cruel to those that they captured, the northern kingdom of Israel had been forced to pay taxes to Assyria during the reign of Jeroboam's great-grandfather, Jehu. And so that practice was continuing. And they were, they were receiving taxes from the people of Israel. And that's why Jonah hated the Ninevites. Bible scholars believe that the book of Jonah was written during the reign of Israel's King Jeroboam II, who ruled from 783 to 553 B.C. The date of God's command to, to Jonah to go to Nineveh, we're not told specifically when it was in the Bible, but some Bible scholars have suggested that there were two events, in national events in Nineveh, which caused the hearts of the people of Nineveh to be softened toward God. You see, when Jonah went into the city of Nineveh, the people responded to his message, and they experienced a tremendous revival in Nineveh. What brought it about? Well, there was a famine in 770 to 760 B.C. and a solar eclipse on June 15, 1963 B.C. They're believing that, Bible scholars believe that that might have softened the hearts of people toward God. Before this coronavirus epidemic's over, we might see some hearts soften toward God. The greatest thing that could possibly come out of the coronavirus epidemic is that people will once again turn their hearts back toward God. That they once again realize that God is the source of every blessing in their lives. I would again remind you of 2 Chronicles 7, Verses 13 and 14 where God said, When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. We do not know with any certainty. But the coronavirus could be used of God to turn people back to himself. Wouldn't it be great to see God transform our entire country and world through a little virus? God could do it. 
The book of Jonah was written to, and not, not only the nation Israel, but also to people of everywhere. This book that we're going to be studying is relevant not only because it took place years back, but it's every bit as relevant today in our lives. There are three major purposes behind why God gave us the book of Jonah. First off, to reveal that salvation is from God. God saved not only the people of Nineveh, but he saved Jonah out of the belly of a fish. How many times have you and I experienced God sparing us from a serious accident in a car? How many times have we been saved from a, a serious medical issue like a heart attack or stroke and God saved us and raised us back up? That's what we're looking for God to do in John's life. Salvation comes from God. Not only were the people of Nineveh saved, but also Jonah was saved out of the, the belly of the fish. Second purpose behind why God gave us the book of Jonah was to show that salvation is to be given to everyone who will repent of their sins. Isaiah 55, 7 reads, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and he will have, will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will freely pardon. The book of Jonah shows us that everyone who repents of their sins will receive forgiveness from God. Proverbs 28, 13 says, he who conceals his sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. And then third, the book of Jonah was given to teach us that the message of God's grace and forgiveness should not be held back from anyone. As followers of Christ, we are to tell everyone we come in contact with that Jesus loves them and that he died for their sins to save them from their sins. The message of God's plan of salvation is not meant to be kept back. It's to be freely shared with others. The Hebrews who have been chosen by God to be a special people, they did not understand that along with being a special people, they had a special privilege. That privilege was to share the gospel with others. The central theme of the book of Jonah is that repentance reverses God's judgment. You might remember that the word repent means to do an about face. When a person genuinely repents of their sin, they're headed this way with their life, and they head back toward God. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Have you ever wondered, why hasn't Jesus already come back? He's been gone for nearly 2,000 years. 2 Peter 3.9 says, God is not slow. He is giving everyone the opportunity to repent. God is giving man ample opportunity to turn back to him. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 23, God asks these two questions. He says, do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord. Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? In the book of Jonah, we see a central message. Repentance results in the reversal of God's judgment. God doesn't get any pleasure at all out of destroying man. He wants us, as a human race, to turn back to him. There are two miracles that are spoken of in the book of Jonah that cause liberals to doubt the historicity of the book of Jonah. First is the swallowing of Jonah, which will deal with by, by a great fish. We'll deal with that next week. But there was a second miracle, and that was that there was a citywide revival that took place in Jonah's day. Critics of the Bible say there's no evidence that, that a repentance on such a large scale ever took place in Nineveh. However, archaeologists found again, they found a letter by the name of a man by the name of Adad Nero III, who lived from 810 to 8, 782 B.C., he was a king of Assyria. He wrote a letter to a governor named Gehazi as he spoke holding, of holding a day of repentance by royal decree. Now we all know that after the revival in the days of Jonah, it was short-lived. A generation later, after this great revival that's recorded in the book of Jonah, the book of Nahum was written. And Nahum tells us 
that the entire city was destroyed by God. If people reject God's mercy, we sang today of God's grace and His mercy. If they reject God's mercy, they will face God's justice. The key phrase in the book of Jonah comes out of the key verse, which is Jonah 2 verse 9, which reads, Salvation comes from the Lord. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and you know Him as your Lord and Savior, you're saved. The Bible says, and where did you get that salvation from? You got it from God. The prominent people in the book of Jonah include Jonah, the ship's captains and sailors, and the people of Nineveh. And I printed out for you several a, a suggested outline of the book of Jonah by Edgar James. I want to close this introductory message on the book of Jonah by sharing with you some of the more important lessons from the book of Jonah. Lesson number one from the book of Jonah. Don't ever try to run away from God's plan for your life. God has a plan for your life. Just like he had a plan for Jonah's life. Jonah thought that he could escape God's plan. But that simply was not true. Jeremiah the prophet put it like this in Jeremiah 29, verses 11 to 13. For I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. God has a plan for our life, and we better not resist his plan for us. If God's sending you to Nineveh, you better go to Nineveh. If not, you, don't, you might end up in the belly of a fish too. Lesson number two from the book of Jonah. As a follower of Christ, don't pattern your life after Jonah. If you want to follow anyone, follow someone like the Apostle Paul. Don't follow Jonah because he wasn't a good example to anyone. His attitude and his, his defiance was not something you want to follow. Lesson number three. God can send a revival even, even in the midst of the most godless of cities. If God could send a revival into the city of Nineveh, He could send a revival into any city, regardless of its wickedness. God can send a revival even in the midst of godless cities. What's our part? To pray for God to do just that. Pray and ask God to send a revival, not only into the cities overseas, but the cities in America today. Each one of us needs to cry out like the psalmist did in Psalm 85, verses 4 to 7. The psalmist said, Restore us again, O Lord, our God, and put away your displeasure toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again and your people so that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. We need to pray and ask God to send a revival into our world. And lesson number four from the book of Jonah. The grace of God can reach even the most depraved and vile of sinners. No one is beyond the grace of God. The people of Nineveh, they were a wicked, callous, defiant people. And yet God saved them. I shared this illustration in a previous message, but I believe it's worthy of repetition. This illustration comes out of the life of a missionary named Robert Moffat. When Mo Robert Moffat went as a missionary to Afrikaner's tribe, the people of Cape Town, Africa, South Africa, never again expected to see him. They told Robert Moffat, this extremely wicked man named Afrikaner, he's going to use your skull as a drinking cup. Afrikaner had lived in a section of South Africa called Mamakwa Land. Afrikaner was such a hardened person that the governor of Cape Town had offered a $500 reward for him, dead or alive. People were in sheer terror in South Africa because of a man named Afrikaner. But Afrikaner's reputation did not stop Robert Moffat from sharing the gospel with him. Robert Moffat's very first convert in Cape Town was Africaner. Later, Moffat took him to Cape Town with him, 
When the colonial ruler saw this savage changed into a humble Christian man, he said, what a miracle. This is the eighth wonder of the world. God delights in taking the most horrible, wicked person on the earth and making them into a saint of God. The book of Jonah teaches us that absolutely no one is beyond the grace of God. Remember that the next time you think someone's too wicked to be saved. What God did in the life of Africaner, he had previously done in the people of Nineveh. And what God did in the people of Nineveh, he's still doing today in and through the message of the gospel. Every time you read the book of Jonah, from here on out, don't forget this lesson. God can save anyone, regardless of how wicked they are. God can reach those who are wicked today just as quickly as he reached the entire city of Nineveh. Keep sharing the message of salvation. Don't stop. The message is too good to keep to ourselves. We're gathered together not only to worship God, but to edify ourselves and to go forth back into our world and say, God has a message. God loves you and he wants to save you from your sins. And share with them the message of salvation. You never know when God's going to use something that you say to reach another person with the gospel. Let's close with a word of prayer followed by singing, Make Me a Blessing. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you and praise you that you've given us this opportunity to come together to remind ourselves of the book of Jonah and the lessons that we can learn from this great book. We ask, Lord, that you would empower us with the message of your truth and help us, Lord, to be faithful, to proclaim the gospel to those we come in contact with. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Join me.